We have another exciting panel ahead of us, AI and the future of national security. Large language models like ChatGPT present myriad challenges to national defense. Our panel this afternoon will look at the security and international arms race around AI, while also giving thought to regulation challenges and innovative application uses. It will be really a nice continuation of all of the many things that we've been talking about. In fact, I'm certain that we could do a two-day panel and more just on uh, large language model, uh, models. The discussion will be led by Dr. Jules White from Vanderbilt University. You had the chance to hear him in a panel earlier today. Dr. White is Associate Dean of Strategic Learning Programs in the School of Engineering and Associate Professor of Computer Science. He is a National Science Foundation Career Award recipient and has published over 160 papers. Doctors, Dr. White's research focuses on large language models such as ChatGPT, prompt engineering, and cybersecurity. Please join me in welcoming Dr. White and the panel. So thank you. We're, we're excited to uh, talk about this topic. And when I knew I was going to be moderating this panel, of course, I had to figure out how am I going to work ChatGPT into it. And I'm sure <laughs> the audience may work it in through questions that are submitted on the iPad that I have here. But so I thought about what could I do? Obviously, I can't have ChatGPT asking all the questions. Maybe we could and answering them too, potentially. But so what I've done is I've actually, in the introductions for the panelists, some of them are written by ChatGPT and some of them are written by a human. Um, so I'll be curious if anybody can tell the difference. Um, I certainly probably couldn't um, if I was in the audience. But um, we have a number of fantastic panelists. So uh, Dr. Tom Campbell is a globally recognized senior analyst and researcher in emerging and disruptive technologies. He is the founder and CEO of Future Grasp, co-director of Leap Manufacturing, and has held advisory roles with various organizations, including Bootstrap Labs and the Council on Competitiveness. Previously, he served as the National Intelligence Officer for Technology with the National Intelligence Council. Um, Eric Tuning is the Executive Vice President of Strategy and Development for HII, America's largest shipbuilder, um, with over 20 years of experience in national security, technology, and business. Um, prior to joining HII, he co-led McKinsey & Company's aerospace and defense practice, and he has served in a variety of government roles, including Chief of Staff to the U.S. Secretary of Defense and Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Industrial Policy. Dr. Charles Clancy is a Senior Vice President at MITRE, heading MITRE Labs, and serving as the company's Chief Futurist. Prior to joining MITRE, he was a Bradley Distinguished Professor of Cybersecurity at Virginia Tech and Executive Director of the Hume Center for National Security and Technology. Dr. Sarah Shoker is a Research Scientist at OpenAI, where she leads the geopolitics team under the Policy Research Department. She was previously a SSHRC postdoctoral fellow in political science at the University of Waterloo, where she worked on the policy impact of emerging technologies on international security. So please welcome our panelists. Um, we're excited to uh, hear their perspective. So to get this started, I wanted to just kick off with a question for each of the panelists. So a lot of the time, people immediately assume that applications of large language models when we're talking about national security are going to be in offense. Um, but there's lots of, of aspects of national security ranging from things in supply chain that we heard with Ukraine um, to all kinds of things with competitiveness and logistics. So I'd like each of the panelists to talk about what are you seeing as the emerging sort of near-term exciting applications of large language models um, you know, related to uh, national security. And so Tom, if you would sure. like to start. Well, appreciate the introduction, Jules, and uh, it's a pleasure to be Back at Vanderbilt University, my alma mater from a long time ago. And so <laughs> the thrill to be back on campus again. There's been a few new buildings constructed since I was last year, I suspect. So um, in terms of LLMs, I, it is a rapidly moving space, in fact. So last week, I was in Silicon Valley on a chat GPT um, seminar. And the uh, comments that I got from several leading experts in artificial intelligence based in the heart of it all was essentially this is considered by them a Sputnik moment. Um, Sputnik being the uh, overarching uh, satellite that uh, launched the entire aerospace rocketry industry back in the late 50s. 
And I actually believe that is a true statement um, from, from the artificial intelligence perspective. In terms of near-term near applications in the defense community, I think one of the quickest things we might see is training and documentation. So to be able to train a specific military agency on the corpus of knowledge specific to that agency. So that would be sort of micro-modeling, if you will, as opposed to the corpus of all the internet's knowledge and baseline and so forth. And that could enable um, specialized Gen AI systems on them. So you could have some text summarizations. You could have seeking knowledge about how to optimize systems. So that is to say, if there's an error in a training system or in some documentation, you could fix that potentially automatically, which is awfully difficult to do if you have millions of pages of technology documents that aren't necessarily easily read by a single human being. And so I'll stop there. I would love to hear what the excellent comments from the other panelists are, but that's just my prima facie take on the space right now. And I'm sure there's gonna be a lot more. Yeah, no, it's great. Um, and my wife's from Nashville, so we're here all the time. And it's always great to be back at Vanderbilt with, with all you. Um, mm -hmm. I, so I think, as I think about AI and national security, there's like three broad buckets, right? So like bucket one is like AI's impact on war fighting. Bucket two is AI's impact on the economy because that integration between economic security and national security, I think, is top of mind when we think about competition with China. And the third bucket is like AI's impact on society. So if I go to that second bucket, because uh, that's where I spend most of my time now, and think about, all right, what's AI's impact on the economy, particularly with respect to, say, the defense industrial base, right, and our ability to generate the material we need to fight and win wars, uh, where, where we're immediately looking is like exploitation of text assets or how we can use natural language processing and other things to drive efficiency in manufacturing processes, workforce safety issues, right? And then kind of put the business case around that so you can scale where you're applying these techniques in a self-funding way. And I, I think that point is an important one because I think candidly, no one quite knows how this technology is gonna impact enterprises yet, right? And so I think what you're gonna hear is a lot of experimentation, a lot of experimentation by the military, a lot of experimentation by companies, um, and, and, and you need to do the experimentation to sort of figure out where you can gain and scale and where that makes sense, and then quite candidly where it doesn't. Um, I guess my perspective is that by and large, um, the, the national security ecosystem is not that much different than a, than a large enterprise, right? Yeah. They have the same needs around software development, the same needs around knowledge management. And so I think a lot of the enterprise applications that any company would be interested in will have immediate applicability in the broader national security enterprise. Um, there may be some unique areas. One that comes to mind is uh, training uh, uh, these large language models on, on the federal acquisition regulation. Maybe we can <laughs> dramatically improve uh, the, the, the pace of the uh, acquisition process. Um, but again, I, I don't see it as, as dramatic. I mean, it's, it's software development. It's all the sorts of things that people are thinking about uh, when it comes to, to, to regular enterprises apply in the national security space as well. Yeah, so I think I'm most excited about uh, technologies that reduce friction between government services and governments being able to uh, con connect with people residing within their borders. And I think some great examples are actually already happening. So um, in the state, with, from the State Department even. So in Guinea, for instance, uh, we got word that there were uh, um, embassy employees who were using ChatGPT to improve uh, English language documentation um, and also to help with the drafting of press releases. And that particular embassy is a little under-resourced so being able to fill the gap in terms of human resources and what you know, the employees there are able to do, I think is a fantastic productivity hack, if I can say. Hmm. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to, see, to seeing how um, government employees continue to, to use our, our products and other large language models in the ecosystem to better service uh, the people that they're in contact with on a day-to-day -day basis. Oh, great. Sarah, you know, one of the things that you had sort of mentioned in, in our discussions was this risk that we become too dependent too quickly on these models before we really understand them um, fully. So if you were giving advice on evaluating a problem, is it really suitable to explore in the near term for large language models? Like what, what would be the advice that you would give? Right, I think that's a, decept a deceptively complicated question, um, but I'll throw out a few considerations uh, with the caveat being this is not going to be an exhaustive list of considerations. So the first thing I would say is, if, if you haven't, take a look at the relevant model or system card that is attached to each, to each model. 
um, model and system cards are becoming, I would say, consider industry standard. Um, if you aren't familiar with what a model or a system card is, you can think of it as a nutrition label. So similar to a consumer going into a grocery store and then trying to uh, understand what it is that they're actually purchasing, the model and system card will detail risks about the uh, about the system or the model that you're trying to that you're trying to use, and it should help you make a more informed decision as a consumer if you are interested in, in using the product. Um, other considerations to, to think about um, are, you know, are you able to monitor? Uh, are you able to evaluate the the system on an ongoing basis? Uh, what does interpretability of that system look like? We're talking about black box systems. So if you're working in a domain that requires that you're able to explain how a particular decision was reached, then it could be that a large language model is not suited for that particular task. Um, because interpretability and explainability are still really big challenges within, within the field. There are other, you know, common, you know, there are other uh, considerations that I think uh, are similar with any other software system. So security, are you actually able to secure the system uh, sufficiently? Um, uh, what are the ethical and social implications of using that model? And have you actually been able to red team and detail um, and detail what the anticipated outcomes will be <coughs> socially if you decide to integrate the model into your workflow? So maybe I'll stop there, but that, those are a few considerations um, that I think could be useful if, if someone were to were to integrate a large language model into their work stream. Yeah, that's very helpful. Maybe I'll pivot then on that to Charles and, and ask the question. So, you know, cybersecurity just came up as an issue. And so as we begin deploying these models, it's probably inevitable that they themselves will be targets of our adversaries, but also that we have to deal with the disinformation, which we've heard a lot about. So, you know, partly this is sort of exposing issues that we already have and maybe exacerbating them. I mean, you know, how prepared do you think we are from a cybersecurity perspective and from an information you know, assurance perspective to be able to handle this change? Yeah, I think, um, so I guess first keep in mind that these AI models are gonna be integrated into larger IT systems. Mm -hmm. And so to a certain extent, AI is just a subsystem in a larger system and um, those, uh, those larger IT systems already have some amount of cyber defenses on them, right? They're, they're connected, it's say, connected to the internet. Um, and so I think the question really is about the intersection of the two. It's about how do you secure the AI components, unique, the unique vulnerabilities of AI components in larger complex IT systems. Um, so for example, at MITRE, we have been, been thinking about a lot of the, the tactics, techniques, and procedures that adversaries might use to exploit a larger system where exploiting the AI is just one step in, that, uh, uh, in the kill chain, if you will, of, of what they're trying to do. Um, and so uh, as, as you think about it first, I guess the, the first point is really just to realize that these are very coupled and you need to think about them interacting with one another. Um, and then from there, you can think about how, how do you defend this? What are the unique vulnerabilities? What's the threat surface of this piece? And how do you then build defenses against it? Um, part of it comes down to test and evaluation. Um, if your model has backdoors in it, it has uh, data, it, it's, it's, its training data has been poisoned, uh, then those sorts of things can lead to vulnerabilities down the road. Also, if someone's able to hack the system that's running the model, right, then they're able to manipulate the weights and change the behavior. Um, and so that's equally a, a, a threat. And so um, I think a lot of early AI research focused on uh, the sort of the model once running was, 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 was completely secure and impenetrable. And so we thought about ways to backdoor the models and manipulate it a priori, uh, or find ways to cause it to misclassify something, for example, uh, at runtime. But um, arguably, uh, just as, as large a threat is gonna be attacking the system that's running the model at runtime and being able to, to manipulate its behavior that way as well. So just as a follow-up, there's been a lot of discussion about you know, an adversary using its ability to generate code and plan and things to build sophisticated attacks. Are you worried a lot about that right now in the near term, or do you think that's something that's really farther out in the future? Um, yes, yeah, so there's all kinds of different pieces to that. So yes, I mean, I think you could imagine um, a, a, a cyber network operations platform, right? Uh, think, in, in, again, in the cybersecurity space, um, Metasploit, for example, is the commonly available open source tool that has all kinds of different uh, malware components in it and a command prompt that you as a user are typing in what you want to do next, 
right? So I think the near-term scenario is more likely that you'd have a sort of chatbot co-pilot that's helping you navigate mm -hmm. uh, and recommend the next step in a, a multi-stage attack against a system. Um, I don't see necessarily, at least in the near term, that that, that, would, that, that, that would be sort of headless and happening uh, completely autonomously. Um, if, uh, and certainly there are, are examples of, of more autonomous malware that, that kind of get out, but um, I think it's really that kind of co-pilot scenario uh, that is what we might see in the near future. Yep. So one of the things we were talking about at the break was just how rapidly uh, uh, things were evolving. And Charles and I were having this discussion that, you know, I, I made a statement, he said, but if you check today, and then, you know, that was a good point. Like things are checking so, you know, changing so quickly. So Eric, I had a question for you, which is that, you know, when we have it, you know, evolving so rapidly, but national security policy often evolves much more slowly, you know, how do we reconcile this and make sure yeah. that we are safe and secure? Yeah, it, it's a good question. And so I think it really comes down to there's like four elements that drive the reconciliation and like reasonable people are gonna take different approaches about each of the four elements, which is why I think it is an important debate. So like the first element is like the, the political policy. And what I mean by that is the framework for how, and I'll just talk in terms of the military, right? The military is gonna use AI, right? Like the US Department of Defense has issued its statement of principles around the use of AI. Um, you know, the Chinese, the CCP recently issued theirs, right? There's obviously a difference between how we're thinking about the use of AI. And so, you know, embedded in that, I think, is this tension that says, and I'll draw on the, um, the Looney Tunes analogy from earlier in the day, right? If, if you think we're at that point where we're out over the cliff and there's nothing below us, you're going to write policies that are designed for us not to fall. If you think we're on a ledge and the other person strapped an acne, acne rocket to their back, and they're about to take off, you're going to write policies to make sure you're not left behind. And you know, I think a lot of the public discourse about this are people who are representing perspectives in either camp, right? And, and the policy has to integrate those and figure out what the answer is. So that's like that's just the policy piece, right? Then there's you get to the second element that is the capability. Like, what does the actual technology do, right? Am I using the technology to plan a strategic operation? Am I using the technology just to make sense of sensor data? Am I using the technology to you know conduct a cybersecurity operation? That the, the, the nature of the technology matters here a lot, actually, right? Is it, and then you get to this third element around the CONOP, or the concept of operations, right? For things to scale in the military, you have to know how you're going to use them, right? Because then I got to buy them at scale. So like, how, what's the concept for how I'm going to fight this technology? And then you get to this fourth piece around the acquisition approach, right? Because like, you know, those of you who worked with the Department of Defense know it isn't necessarily the easiest organization to do business with, right? So like, how, how is, appropri is funding appropriated set up? Um, have, have the intellectual property rights been resolved, right? You know, is the, it, it's all these value of death issues that we run into with other technologies. So part of the reason why you see this separation in kind of the, the evolution in the technology in the commercial sphere and its application in the government is like, for things to move quickly in government, all four of those pillars have to be lined up so you can go, mm -hmm. right? So, and if they're not, the system's got to try and line them up. And candidly, they may be lined up faster in certain segments than in others, which is why you see these pockets of experimentation to try and get them aligned in certain areas that then you can kind of grow. Mm -hmm. As a follow-up, have you seen certain areas of government that seem to be experimenting faster than others, or? Well, this is the this is the interesting like so where, where Brett was with you know Defense Digital Service or the experimentation that DIU is doing like one of the things the department has done is like created these incubation hubs to try and experiment with these things in a contained way very quickly that they then could potentially scale right that the challenge isn't ever the experimentation the challenge is in the scaling so, uh, implementation yeah <coughs> so Tom I'd like to ask you maybe switch a little bit. Um, how disruptive will these technologies be to our current sort of defense manufacturing processes and approaches? I know acquisition was just discussed, but you know, what, where do you see them being adopted and are they really going to radically change time and cost and other aspects from your perspective? So as we would say in the intelligence community, the bottom line up front, yes, yes, and yes. So uh, I see it as very disruptive. And the reason I say that is I, I am in an interesting situation, and, and Jules did a great introduction of all of us, and I live in the great state of Colorado, high in the Rocky Mountains, and so I'm constantly in Silicon Valley, as well as Washington, D.C., and so I see both poles of both coasts. And it's fascinating to live in those sort of bridge liaison worlds 
Last month alone, and this statistic has probably moved further since I last saw this last week, there were over 1,000 startups started on ChatGPT in Silicon Valley. Granted, 90% or so of those will fail, but the froth in that space is unprecedented as I've ever seen for artificial intelligence or really almost any technology. Perhaps biotech in some spaces could be considered uh, perhaps competitive. So the R&D startups cover the breadth of defense from large language models to, for text to video to audio to entertainment to automated coding as we've heard so well from so many other lustrous speakers this, this week. And so the situation I see right now with ChatGPT and Gen AI systems is it's highly disruptive. And I say that from the uh, intelligence community perspective parlance where we, we have specific adjectives we attach to things and so forth. And moreover, it will change very rapidly. I, I even was on Twitter this morning and I, somebody on Twitter said, oh, ChatGPT is, is yesterday's news. Here's the new thing. We're adding Google Chrome extensions and there's new apps and everything else. So it is moving along blazingly fast. As our prior keynote said, it, it's, it's 3x Moore's Law. I don't know exactly the nuances of that statistic, but I think that's about right. And I defer to my great colleague from OpenAI and maybe the, the speed at which it's scaling and so forth. And so a few forecasts, if you will, that I'll, I'll just throw down the line. I know I'm being recorded here, but I just say forecast, not prediction. Um, in less than two years, <laughs> writing and programming and anything creative, video, audio, will be either dramatically augmented or completely executed by artificial intelligence, ChatGPT, and all the similar models. That's less than two years. And I say that with some level of confidence because a number of venture capitalists have put out blog posts and they're actually relatively conservative. I got on a Twitter debate this morning in comments with somebody put out some estimates for the next 10 years and I said, oh, that's really conservative. And all the comments back to me, oh, Tom, you're absolutely right. And so uh, the flip side of that from the def national defense perspective, the threats are then going to be similarly exponential. So we heard from our great folks yesterday, misinformation, disinformation are going to soar as we get in these spaces. Nevertheless, the cost then will come down for all these things, which is both good for national defense and bad for national defense. The good thing is things might become cheaper. We may have startups which can offer things at a free level, maybe some adware and so forth. We know Google is working on their own versions of ChatGPT to implement directly into their search engine itself and maybe even change the direct search engine itself. And so you may be typing things in and it'll spit out everything you ever wanted to know about something as opposed to just a bunch of links. Um, the bad news is adversarial states, your China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, will have easy access to those things as well. Mm -hmm. And even non-state actors, which in some ways I'm even more fearful about non-state actors. So the gentleman who may have a thousand dollar laptop who is some um, individual who is upset with something in the United States may just decide to release some nasty malware that he just typed in with a few command prompts very easily. These are things that from the national security perspective we need to t pay rigorous attention to and one way, I'll, I, I'll stop here in a minute, but to do that I would encourage everybody in the national defense community engage deeply with Silicon Valley. I know there's been many conversations about this already, but go to the folks that are the founders. Engage with them, the people on the ground in OpenAI, on the ground in, in Google, on the ground, not just the meta companies, but also the smaller companies, the founders who are developing maybe something new you've never even thought about. Because with every new technology instantiation, there's always something that pops out of the woodwork that nobody's ever thought of before. It would make a much better situation for the national security community to know about that in advance before it hits. And so hopefully that answers in a long-winded manner your question there. Yeah, absolutely. That's, well, I think that segues well into the, the next question, which maybe we'll start with Sarah, but get all of the panelists' perspectives on this. So, you know, from a, a national competitive and security standpoint, we have a lead, um, you know, in this because it came out here and we have sort of the expertise in it. Um, at the same time, there's been all of this discussion about regulation. There's been these open letters about pausing and should we be continuing. Um, a lot of fear over what's going to happen. Um, so it's likely that you know other countries, other organizations aren't putting guardrails. They're not putting stops, in, you know, uh, regulations in place. So what is your perspective on regula regulation, the guardrails, and how we sort of reconcile this? What everybody else is going to be doing potentially versus what we're doing. 
I want to answer this question briefly, but I'm not sure if I can. <laughs> um, maybe I'll first say that I don't think regulation is antagonistic to innovation. Um, I think there are a number of issues at the DOD uh, related to procurement, long hiring times, and inability to offer uh, wages and salaries that are competitive with Silicon Valley. Those aren't regulatory problems that are stopping innovation. Um, I would also say that, in my view, the reason we can attract such, um, you know, I, th I think I, I work, I have the best colleagues, um, we're able to attract the best engineers and policy thinkers, uh, in part because we do care about safety and risk mitigation. And so I think as a recruitment tactic to say, okay, you get to innovate, but we won't worry about regulation, will actually not attract the right people. Um, the culture and the community surrounding large language models, the, I think there's just a general consensus that safety matters quite a lot. And that's what, you know, that, and I think we're able to attract the best people because we also have a large, um, we, we dedicate a number of resources to safety mitigation and not just capability enhancement. So I would, I would also say that in comparison to um, maybe some other, other countries who are looking to, uh, you know, looking for some kind of competitive edge by integrating large language models, there's a reason why we're, you know, why the United States is viewed as a moral leader in the rules-based international system. And it's moral leadership is, is I think the key, the key terms, is the key term there. If you, you know, start, in, you know, integrating large language models into workflows and they run counter to liberal democratic norms, then what, you know, what exactly are we also normalizing globally? And if there are other countries who are caught in between and they decide to look at the international landscape, then what exactly is our value add and what do we offer to those countries um, if they can't really distinguish between the way we use models versus what other competitor, how other competitors might use those models as well. So I generally view um, a strong commitment to safety as an advantage um, and as influencing and informing innovation rather than running counter to it. Hopefully that answers your question. Absolutely. Maybe one quick follow-up. Are you seeing um, very different policies internationally and in how it's being approached? So I think, right, okay, so I don't even know if it's necessarily internationally. I think there's, there's variation even within the United States amongst different labs as well. So for, for instance, um, some image generation companies have taken, you know, have taken the stance that Sure, you can generate imagery of certain political figures in the United States because we have very different, um, you know, very different laws surrounding freedom of speech and expression. While they'll, you know, not allow the generation of, uh, say, Chinese political leaders, mm -hmm. and that's an, you know, those are American companies. Um, and I understand, you know, I understand the motivation behind that because you do want to function in all markets and you want to abide by you know, by, 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 by their norms and, and to be able to function in their, their market, you have to, there are some sacrifices that you have to make. Um, but I think from a, a governance standpoint, I, our, step one would be to look at the current ecosystem within the United States um, and also in the UK um, and other liberal democratic countries and see what kind of safety standards that we can agree to collectively. Um, I'm not so cynical as to think that you, labs that are working on large language models in China don't have any interest in ethics. I think empirically it's, it, it, you know, we've demonstrated, or not we, but researchers have demonstrated um, at, at U.S. institutions that there is a lot of interest um, in ethical standards around the world. Um, and, opt, you know, I'm optimistic that we can find some areas of consensus where we can get the ball rolling internationally on safety. I'm not so optimistic as to believe we'll reconcile all our differences, but I think there's definitely some room to, to start and room to grow. So uh, I think my, again, every day uh, new information shows up and, and you kind of rethink some of these questions. Um, <laughs> it, it's, uh, it's an interesting space. So I'd say uh, a week ago, if you'd asked me this question, I would have, have cited the fact that it takes 20 plus million dollars to train one of these big models that has created a, um, a, a select few people who have the financial resources to train uh, some of these large language models. And that basically means you've got 
U.S. tech companies and Chinese tech companies who are primarily driving the advancement of these. Um, with the Chinese tech companies, uh, if you just look at, I don't know, the number of parameters in their model versus time, they're, they're I, mean, I don't know, maybe nine months behind us in terms of the, the complexity of the models that they're building and deploying. Um, but I think with the, with the release of Meta's um, uh, model and the leak of their weights, right, the open source community has gotten very active in the last uh, six weeks, right? They have, have, and they don't have the millions of dollars to train these models, so they're figuring out how you retrain these models for much less. And so we're seeing now, like, uh, there's, there's the proliferation of, uh, of, of large language models that are uh, orders of magnitude smaller, can be trained for $100, and I, I, I don't know that we were quite expecting that. Um, and I think that that's going to change the landscape considerably, and to the point where um, if, if there's so much proliferation, how do you even enforce any kind of regulatory regime? Um, because it's open source and everybody, everybody's using it. So um, if, it's, if it's a handful of large tech companies, it's easier to regulate. If it's literally everyone, then it's, it's going to be impossible. Yeah, I, I, so I think great points and maybe drawing on those and actually something Gil had said during his speech. I, there's an element of regulation that whenever you talk a new technology, national security and international, you're going to walk yourself into a conversation on export controls. And I think we've got to figure out what we want that answer to be because there's a lot of history around the adverse impact of trying to control technology when we're trying to develop it. And so that isn't an argument for export controls. Maybe Claire, I'm not arguing for it. I'm just saying like the community's got to have a perspective around do you control it? Do you not control it? If you do control it, what elements get controlled? Um, do we want to create a new system where with like-minded allies and partners you develop these technologies? I mean, I, I think those are going to be some of the big questions that for want of us not having a framework, we may end up with an answer that isn't the answer that is optimizing for what the outcome is, but we sort of all end up in Abilene and we didn't intend to. And so I think it's, it's we've got to get out in front of where the export control conversation is going to go. In terms of regulating, uh, this is always a question, every new technology that comes out, should we regulate it? Should we stop it? Should we have a moratorium on it? I vividly remember even 10 years ago in nanotechnology, they were saying, we should stop all nanotechnology research. Well, that's kind of impossible. And I think it's even more impossible. I think Charles is spot on in this context. Because when we go to the micro models, the small language, small large language models, shall we call them? They'll just phrase SLL, maybe a new, <laughs> co new coin phrase there. And um, it will be barely impossible because this, uh, an LLM or even an AI system itself is not like attempting to regulate, it's not like trying to regulate a nuclear weapon. There's no physicality to it. Yeah. So, if you can have somebody in a, in a back room in Silicon Valley or in a coffee shop coding, how are you going to monitor that? How are you going to stop it? And maybe the, the large companies may adhere to certain government regulations and say, OK, we will adhere to that. But all the others, uh, the, the small founders and so forth, they'll just ignore you because they want to do something that's kind of cool to do and make good money off of it. And moreover, uh, there's, there's a risk if we regulate in the United States other countries, as I said, the adversarial state, states, they won't care. China's not going to regulate. They're developing their own versions of chat GPT and large language models, I'm certain now. And so it's a, it's a question of a sliding scale in cybersecurity where you do nothing or you do everything. I think ultimately we have to be somewhere in the middle of that sliding scale. And the biggest um, mitigation matter we can do is educate the senior policymakers. When I was National Intelligence Officer for Technology, that was my job to try and brief, to write reports and so forth about all technologies. I'm sure the good people in the IC are, are all over this now, and I hope in the DOD as well, to try and make certain that the, re the senior policymakers, those who are in their 70s or 80s and may never even used email in the past, understand what's going down the pipe. Because they, to them, it will be. This is, this is almost fantasy. It's almost miraculous that these things can come out. So to educate them so that as new, every new instantiation comes out, which is essentially going on a week by week, if not day by day basis, they are kept abreast of what's going on so that if there is something that is particularly bad that is not wanting to be done in the United States, they can put a cuff on it. Otherwise, we kind of have to let it go and see where it goes. But leverage it, engage with Silicon Valley. Last mantra, I know I'm beating this to death, but this is super important. I, when I was in 
In the government myself, I ran two or three what we called learning journeys. I, I got cohorts of intelligence community officials. We went through unclassified research amongst many, many companies. That was hugely beneficial to the IC because they saw firsthand on the ground in Silicon Valley what was being done, and then they could take that knowledge back and use it within their briefs and senior policymaker reports and whatnot. I urge the DOD and others to consider doing that sort of aspect. Come to Silicon Valley and see what's going on, get the lay of the land. <coughs> So, Sarah, you touched on this a little bit, but maybe I want to have a little a follow up. Um, there's been kind of this discussion in the news, and, and people are worried about there might be some type of you know AI arms race where everybody's trying to develop, you know, more malicious or, or you know uh, increasingly capable and hostile versions of these things. You know, wh what is your perspective on that? Is that realistic? And do we need to be thinking about how we do you know sort of international cooperation to you know avert that type of outcome? Right. So. I have some reservations about the term AI arms race. Uh, most recently, and I think most frequently since ChatGPT, I've seen journalists use that term to describe increased investment. Um, that's not an arms race. <laughs> I, it's, I, I worry sometimes that we use the term AI arms race to lend um, what is often an, you know, an economic competition, some of the grandeur of defense and international security. Um, I think we, you know, we need to be clear about the language that we're using. Uh, there, there are some serious consequences to using the term arms race, uh, not least of which it causes panic mm. and can cre you know, create an incentive to reason through fear. Um, and you know, arms races are, are simply not, uh, for civilians caught in them, though, you know, those are, that's a very serious condition and we need to, I think, take the term very seriously. So I would, you know, encourage, I would encourage the media that if we are talking about an arms race to actually, to, you know, to basically define your terms. Um, if we're talking about increased VC investment in Silicon Valley, I don't think it's appropriate to use the, you know, the, the terminology of an AI arms race. Now, that being said, um, I think we've highlighted here today that there are definitely a number of security risks that are associated with large language models. I absolutely agree that there are dual use risks associated with LLMs. Um, and I think the issue of proliferation and open source um, and, you know, just the fact that we're now able to run large language models locally on computers, these are all risk vectors um, and they do reapply um, and redistribute power within the international system. So this is a governance issue uh, that, and an ecosystem issue that is not unique to any one company. Now, as a, as a researcher, I often think or you know, my question is often, how would we even know whether we were in an AI arms race? Mm -hmm. um, so AI obviously is a massive bucket of technology, so let's narrow that down and talk about large language models since that's the theme um, of, 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 today's, of today's panel. So historically, when we look at arms racing, what we see is that there is an acceleration of either quantity or quality improvements in a very particular military technology. I am not actually aware of any numbers that look at the integration of large language models into defense. In fact, most, uh, most companies that are building large language models don't partner with defense and national security. Um, and then also historically, again, most of, these, uh, most of the increased investment that you see in conditions of arms racing is, is led by the state, right? It's led by government, government investment. Large language models are built in the private sector, right? Or they're open source. So now we're applying a term that has historically been used on a military technology led by governments to a consumer product developed by private companies. And on top of that, our measurements are, you know, our measurements are kind of iffy when we're talking about dual use anyway, um, as it relates to trying to measure arms racing. So I just think there's, a really, there's just a lack of clarity um, and I think the term often befuddles and confuses more than it illuminates. Uh, now, that doesn't mean we have to ignore safety risks. I absolutely believe that the, the, you know, that this is, that the dual use risks associated with large language models need to be addressed. But when we talk about arms racing without there being any kind of evidence that one is underway, what kind, you know, what kind of incentives are, are we creating? Um, how are we informing the public? How are we engaging with the public who you know, have legitimate concerns and, and fears about this technology to begin with? I just think we need to be more granular and specific 
um, with regards to how we talk about these technologies. Um, they're already complicated systems to begin with. We don't need to make it more, more complicated by mislabeling the, the international environment. Great. Well, um, Eric and Tom, I think you, you talked about it a little bit, but I want to touch on this. And um, so, you know, one thing that as an educator I've been really impressed with is sort of the, the potential for training and, you know, transfer mm -hmm. of knowledge. And, you know, a lot of the discussion, and you know, people are worried about workforce, but there's also obviously a lot of workforce that's needed. We heard all, you yeah. know, other panelists trying to hire. So what is the impact that you see on this in, um, you know, government and national security workforce and the ability to sort of retain and transfer skills in, in a lot of these complex systems? Go ahead, Eric. No, sure. Um, well, I mean, I think if you think about, like, the defense manufacturing base, I, I broaden it to include engineering and software and everything else, because I, you know, last night, for example, I was out to dinner with a couple of engineers, and I said, well, how do you guys interact with these technologies, right? And they're like, oh, we use some of the off-the-shelf tools to help write code and everything else. So I think it's a, it's a kind of a broader workforce challenge. I, I, when, you, when you kind of take that and you talk about, like, impact on the shop floor, you know, in my mind, I, I go to, like, the Industry 4.0 reference cases, right, and say, we're in the middle of this transition anyway in terms of how we use digital technologies to improve manufacturing processes. Um, and so this just becomes another digital tool to potentially help drive some of those outcomes. So like, how do you optimize manufacturing plans, you know, predictive maintenance, use it for quality control, you know, better outcomes. I mean, so there's a, an existing set of use cases and then the question is, 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 is the large language model the right tool for that or is it something that may be a little less exquisite, right? And that, that can get to the business case issue. One of the, I'll call it sort of more horizon type applications that gets, I think, directly to your education example is, in manufacturing, we are experiencing this transition in the workforce, right? Where you've got a generation that's retiring, and then you've got a new generation that's sort of coming into the workforce, manufacturing environment. There's a lot of knowledge loss in the grain of the current workforce. And so what's the ability for these tools to actually help knowledge transfer from the generation that's retiring to the generation that's coming up to skill? Um, that, that I think there is an exciting set of applications that we haven't really scratched the surface on, but I think folks are hopeful. You know, all that knowledge doesn't leave the door as folks retire in, in our manufacturing That's workforce. Excellent point, yeah. Uh, so from my perspective, text normalization, coding, I, I, I can't speak enough about the coding angle. So I, I, I'm not a coder myself. My, I have an engineering degree, several degrees and so forth, but just to be able to uh, riff off several command prompts and be able to code something Almost automatically, I think that will be a game changer for a lot of people. So say you want to develop your own app in the defense community. Well, you can just write a few command prompts and perhaps in the next couple of years be able to do that easily. The other aspect I want to emphasize is the writing. So when I was in the intelligence community, we had a specific writing style called analytic trade craft. And it is a highly rigorous, highly sourced, very pragmatic, very structured form of writing. I actually forecasted many, many years ago I think AI is eventually going to do this because it's very formulaic. And we're getting to that point now. I know that uh, ChatGPT is not so great right now for sourcing. It does have hallucinations. But I have seen some early stage startups which are working aggressively on that to aggressively source documents, to footnote automatically, to annotate things as it goes through. And moreover, even show the sourcing itself from real live journal articles. So professors. Students, this world will change dramatically. In the defense community and intelligence community, I think it will change dramatically. It will augment our work. It will make things perhaps faster. So if you want, need to write a 50-page report, perhaps it may not take you a month, but maybe a week or something. You still have to go through and human check it and so forth. But these are very, very powerful techniques. And uh, I hope that people embrace these within the DOD because they will be done by, again, by our adversaries and things will get faster and faster. Uh, it, these things are exponentially occurring right now, a number of startups and everything else, and just catch a ride because it's going to be a wild ride in the next yeah. few years in these spaces for everybody. So, Charles, I'd like to touch on research a little bit and research investment. So, you know, from your you know, position at MITRE, you see a lot of different things that are taking place um, from a research perspective. So, what is your perspective on where we should be investing in research? Um, regarding these models, particularly related to national defense? Yeah, so I think you, you kind of tie back to what are the key applications where um, there's lots of applications of AI in national defense, right? And so we've been using machine perception for 
um, a decade, right? We're doing all kinds of orchestration optimization type things. All, all of that is reasonably well adopted in different parts of the broader national security enterprise. So I think that the key question is, um, as you look at large language models specifically, where can they uniquely add value in the national security context? And then how do you build the appropriate research around uh, those application spaces? Right, so we talked about some of the, the more mundane enterprise type things. All that research is going to be happening by the private sector anyway. I think DOD should just be along for the ride and take advantage of these new enterprise productivity tools as they, as they come along. Mm -hmm. um, however, there are, as, as Tom was mentioning, there are some specific analytic tasks where there are unique aspects. And I think large language models uh, for things like intelligence analysis would be really, really interesting tools to explore. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're just at the early stages of figuring out if we can hand a, a, a model a whole giant corpus of, of intelligence reports and then be able to ask uh, questions of it um, and have it synthesize and, 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 and give, uh, give responses that are hopefully not hallucinations. <laughs> um, <laughs> just as an example, at MITRE, we, uh, we stood up a, the sort of GPT-3 uh, open source clone and we handed it all of the R&D proposals that had ever been submitted to our internal R&D program, <laughs> right? And we were able to then ask it all sorts of questions about the research that we've been doing at MITRE over the, over the last, uh, last 20 years. So it's fascinating. examples like that, I think, are, are interesting from the intelligence analysis perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's also sort of this broader ambition to tackle sense making mm -hmm. within the AI community uh, writ large. Like I said, we've gotten pretty good at, at orchestration, optimization, um, machine perception. Um, but we, this whole concept of sort of zero shot sense making Right? We can see all of China's pieces on the chessboard, but knowing what that means and, and is, is still a gap. Right? And I think there may be opportunities for large language models to tackle some problems in the sense-making space uh, if we can, again, do the research necessary to apply them. And then, of course, all the safety and alignment type questions uh, apply in, in this space, uh, perhaps even more so than in the commercial space. So um, maybe a follow-up question for each of you around education. I'm particularly interested, Sarah, in, in hmm. uh, your, your answer to this and how, if you can answer. Mm -hmm. um, but education around these tools. So, you know, what is sort of the internal education that's going on within each of your organizations that you're seeing around the tools and as new capabilities are discovered and the research? I mean, it's, it's a lot going on very quickly, but do you have your own sort of internal education approach? Um, and then, you know, how do you, how do you manage this? keeping everybody up to speed? So we do have a very active blog where we post uh, regular updates. Um, that's where actually the GPT-4 technical paper and the system card was first published. Uh, so that's publicly available uh, for anyone to peruse right now. Uh, I'm also very excited, if folks haven't already seen it, about a week ago we released a course. Uh, it's called ChatGPT. Uh, prompt engineering for developers, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and that was in, uh, in collaboration with deeplearning.ai. So that's free for, for the public as well. It's, uh, it's available online. And if you Google uh, ChatGPT prompt engineering for developers, I believe that's the title, <laughs> uh, then you should be able to find it quite easily. Um, and then, of course, many of us are on Twitter and never underestimate Twitter as a tool to do you know, personal outreach, though, of course, our our views as employees are not representative of the company when we are. <laughs> we are tweeting in a personal capacity. Yeah, I don't know. Is it just uh, me, me forwarding tweets uh, to, to my employees saying, hey, check this out? Uh, that's, that's, that's part of it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> within MITRE, for example, we've established, uh, we're in the process of formalizing a community of interest among the, uh, the roughly 700 AI and data science staff that we have. There's a subset that are very interested and involved in these in these areas. Um, we kicked off uh, with a, a big technical exchange about a month ago. There's a, a Teams channel that's now full of chatter constantly uh, of different things that are going on. And in particular, as um, our government sponsors are increasingly interested in um, uh, our viewpoint, our capabilities, uh, and, and helping them test things out uh, through our federally funded research and development centers, then it's a, it's a resource for um, people to, to find the, the experts in the company and begin to help knit things together. Yeah, I'd say we're uh, similar. So we've got a community of practice, a uh, group of folks within our CTO's office that will partner with portions of the business where there may be a, a use case where this technology could be helpful for safety or quality related issues. Um, from my perspective, so in the context of my various companies, I 
run and help advise and so forth. I cover all emerging technologies. And so I look at ChatGPT as an enabler in the convergences space as well. I understand there's people putting ChatGPT into robots, for example, having them speak back to you and so forth in an AGI-like, artificial general, general intelligence-like environment, um, bio nanotechnology, all these spaces. So if you could imagine, uh, I'll just throw out an example, train on the entire corpus of the USPTO patents. Create something new. AI could probably do that pretty quickly. You'd have to double check and everything, the veracity of it and so forth. But these are the tractions in which people are just starting to work out. And so engaging with the founders, as I was talking to last week in Silicon Valley, the, the ideas are just popping like champagne bubbles right now. It's unbelievable what's going on in uh, the coffee shops in San Francisco and so forth. And the new ideas that they are coming up with, we don't even know what will be invented ultimately. Like every technology, we get surprised, which is, I think, honestly, one of the funnest parts about being in technology is you can <laughs> come up with new ideas. But this, the flip side is there are new threats that also we will be surprised by. So we need to watch both angles. So, so we have a question from the audience, and this is probably for, for Charles and Sarah. So, you know, now that there's, you know, greater awareness that these models are being trained, um, there's going to be a risk that people try to manipulate the data that they're being trained on. And so how do you go and protect against, you know, poisoning of that data um, going forward? I guess my thought is that um, the, the corpuses of data that these are trained on is so massive. Um, I, I mean, it would seem difficult to effectively bias or poison these huge data sets that are, are, are widely available. Mm -hmm. But I think the area where we may see concern is, is more in the, the supervised learning and, and, and reinforcement learning with human feedback that is, mm -hmm. is creating the sort of veneer on top of the, the much larger model where there may be opportunities for manipulation uh, in order to affect behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of, of I don't know, I, I wouldn't expect being able to go in and, and make edits on Wikipedia that are going to uh, sort of durably affect the output of, of, a, of a trained large language model uh, uh, six months later. So something interesting happened when we released ChatGPT. Um, within about a week, the online community, the online user community, decided that um, it turned into a bit of a game, right? The j mm -hmm. jailbreaks. Mm -hmm. Trying to figure out ways to alter the model's behavior so that the model said something undesirable or offensive or somewhat embarrassing. Mm -hmm. This was actually very useful for us. Um, and also, very kindly, many users online have collected these jailbreaks, and there are now websites dedicated to ChatGPT jailbreaks. So we are actually able to use that information to further improve, um, to further improve our model behavior. And we can think about, you know, I, I think of it as, as public red teaming, effectively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's it's extremely useful. Um, we also just launched a bug bounty program for vulnerability discovery. Um, and yes, there are cash prizes. So if you, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if you do uh, discover a vulnerability in our systems, um, there is a, you know, a method for compensation if you would like to report. Um, f finally, I think you know, data poisoning, I think the closest thing that we have now um, that researchers have demonstrated are prompt injection attacks. Um, and again, I think the online community has been, like the enthusi enthusiasm around these systems has been such that when people discover vulnerabilities um, or risks, they publish, they talk about it very widely. Um, and so we're able to, you know, we're, we have a very strong research identity. Most of us are, or a good fraction of us at OpenAI are researchers and come from a research background. So we're able to build on those relationships to further, further secure our systems. Um, but I will say that safety is, you know, it's, 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 not, it's not a finish line. You are, we're always working on it, and it is an ongoing, an ongoing process. And that includes, you know, stuff like red teaming. That includes, like, that, that includes being able to learn from the public um, and the way they interact with our systems as well. So it's not, not a risk, but I feel relatively optimistic that we've been able to um, move a, you know, a, far, you know, a long way even between ChatGPT and GPT-4, the releases between ChatGPT and GPT-4. Um, and I think most of our users who interact with both, with both of those systems can definitely see a difference even in that short amount of time. So, Red teaming, both with contracted with contracted red teamers and with the public, it's just that absolutely fantastic method for one of you know one of many methods for safety mitigation. But I thought I'd highlight that particular one here. Great. 
So I think we have one more question that'll probably take us to the end from the audience. And so the question is, can we look at the conception of large language models in the US as a strategic advantage and invest the energy and resources to embrace the technology like we did with the assembly line? And if so, how can we get there? So I'll leave it open. <laughs> but I'm staring at Charles. So. All right, OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think, of course, um, I, I would say I, I think that it is to our strategic advantage to have the innovation the core innovation of large language models happened in the US and to have the ecosystem of the thousand startups Tom was talking about also happen in the US, right, of all the application uh, areas, right? Those are the things that will sort of durably accrue value to the US GDP mm -hmm. and will help support us in the long run. Um, I, I think, though, that we shouldn't feel as though we have a, a monopoly on, on this research or the technology. Mm -hmm. And we, I guess, need to realize that other countries and the open source community as a whole is going to, to democratize it. And um, so any gains that we have are, um, uh, I mean, could be transient, right? So we have to, have to think that mm -hmm. through. And how do, you, how do you build the ecosystem that will sustain those gains in the long run? It's not like 5G where we can sanction uh, Huawei and sort of make them trip and fall and then quickly decide ORAN is what the US needs, invest a whole bunch of money in it to rebuild the US ecosystem, mm -hmm. and then sort of have an advantage. I mean, this is all software. So it's, it, there, it's, there's no hardware that's necessarily going to be able to, um, uh, to provide a, a durable advantage. And, the extent to which GPUs were the hardware that were was required is decreasingly part of the puzzle as all these new um, training algorithms come along that require much less compute uh, to train the models. I would follow up on Charles' great comments there. It's, I believe it's an absolutely a strategic advantage to the United States to have this homegrown, shall we say, from our great colleagues at OpenAI and elsewhere. Um, we need to embrace it, however. Um, a lot of times with technologies, strategic advantages get lost. They drift overseas. So I would hate to have um, startups in, go over to Europe or go, worst case, China or Russia or elsewhere uh, because they are not embraced by the national security community or elsewhere. So again, talk to these folks because they are doing amazing things in Silicon Valley and it will continue whether we like it or not and because they're often uh, interested in having done cool things and being first to do it and making a lot of money off of it. We want to channel that great energy into the good for the national security community, our economy and whatnot. And I encourage everybody to do that. Yeah, I think the answer will come down to people, right? Because if you think that the, one of the key differences in, say, the assembly line example was that if all this stuff is open source and you can proliferate information now in ways you couldn't when the assembly line was created, you know, 115 years ago, that it's going to come down to like your competitive edge in human capital. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Well, thank you so much. And let's thank our panelists for a fantastic discussion. Thank you.